Splines are probably the most common way to fit nonlinear functions in additive models and in GAMS, so it's important to have some understanding about them. And this is exactly what we'll do in this video, which will be divided into two parts. And after that, we'll see how to fit GAMS that use splines or any other basis expansion. Note that splines are also used in the context of computer graphics to draw objects, but this video will focus on their use as smooth function approximators. In the end of the second part, I will mention briefly how the two approaches relate to each other, but if you're coming for the computer graphics stuff, you might want to search for some more specific material. So, in the last video, we mentioned that instead of a linear function in X, we want to model the relationship between Y and X in a more complex way. We mentioned several ways we can do this. In this video, we will focus on basis functions. We will start with the basic polynomials, but then move on to splines. There are also other basis functions we can use, like Fourier and Wavelet, but they will be the topic of a future video. Basis functions mean we expand X to some feature space phi of X. Notice that even if we do this, the regression problem is still linear in coefficients. So we move from the regular X design matrix to this expanded phi matrix with all the different features we use. We therefore move from this linear X times beta to this nonlinear phi of X times beta. We can continue regularly, do OLS, and get the solution in terms of phi of X. Now one type of basis expansion is using polynomials. That is, instead of only using x, use also x squared, x cubed, etc. Normally, we will use orthogonal polynomials to avoid multicollinearity issues. The pro of using this method is that polynomials are very smooth functions. The downside is that these base functions are global. Changing the coefficient of one base, say of x squared, changes the entire function. And that is also true for fitting these polynomials to data. Changing a data point on one side of the scatter plot can affect the function in another side. An alternative is to use piecewise polynomials in varying degrees. Piecewise constant, piecewise linear, quadratic, cubic, etc. The upside is that using piecewise graphs is very local. Changes only affect the segment they occur in. The downside is that there will be jumps or discontinuities in the graph. And also, we need to choose where each piece starts and ends what are called the not points. Here you can see some data and different global polynomials fitted to it, from just a linear term all the way to ninth degree polynomial. Here I focus on the third degree polynomial. What happens if I move a point in the left side of the scatter plot? We can see that the new fit is different, but not only on the left side, also on the right. This is the problem with having global basis functions. Here you can see piecewise polynomials fitted to the data. What this means is that in each segment a different regression is fit. Here with only constant terms, here with linear terms, here with quadratic, and here with cubic. How do we fit these piecewise functions? For piecewise constant we have an indicator function for each segment as a feature. These are the intercepts. So each column will have ones for the data points in that segment and zeros elsewhere. Using this feature matrix phi, the solution is the same. For the piecewise linear, we can simply expand the matrix and in addition to the intercepts, add the x's multiplied by the indicator function for the slopes. We'll get a vector of coefficients, first for the different intercepts and then for the different slopes in each segment. For example, if we have one knot and two segments, we'll end up with this vector of coefficients. And we can continue and do the same for second and third degree as well. Splines are a good compromise between global and piecewise polynomials. They are smooth to different degrees and they are local. For a cubic spline, we have a second degree continuity, meaning that at the knots, x primes, the function is continuous. And also, the first and second derivative are continuous. We use the minus and plus symbols to indicate left and right of the point because this is where the function changes. We should realize that the f function consists of two piecewise polynomial functions that are joined at the knot, and so we can write it like this. Now, why can't we ask that the third derivative be continuous? Because if we do this, we are back to a global cubic polynomial, as you can see from this derivation here. Here is how a linear spline with three knots looks like. It has zero continuity, meaning the function is continuous, but its derivatives are not. This is how a quadratic spline looks like, and this is how a cubic one looks like. Because of the continuity constraints, 
there is a simple way to write splines algebraically. For every knot, we can add the following term, which is equal to x minus x prime if x is greater than x prime, and zero otherwise. This makes sense because we're essentially telling the function it can change direction at every knot location. These extra knot terms are sort of levers we can pull and push to change how the function acts past the knot value. Here is a demonstration of this. So for a linear spline with one knot, we simply add this extra term to the phi matrix. Notice the difference. In piecewise linear, we needed four columns, two for the different intercepts and two for the different slopes. Here we only need three. This is because of the one constraint we imposed, that the two lines must meet at the knot. So whatever alpha 0, alpha 1, and beta 1 we choose, beta 0 will be determined because the two graphs must meet at the knot intersection. Once we fit the model, we get the coefficients. If we reparameterize beta 1 as follows, we get that the two different functions are these, where we can call this beta 0. This is true for higher order splines as well. For example, for a quadratic spline with one knot, we will have the following basis expansion. Notice that here, since we have two constraints, we will have two restricted parameters and only four free parameters. This also generalizes to more knots. For example, this is the matrix for a degree D polynomial with two knots. We add all the regular polynomial terms and then the knot terms with degree D. Here you can see a demonstration of a cubic spline with one knot at x equal two. You can see that because we demand continuity of the first and second derivative, the function cannot break too much at the knot, because the function must retain a degree of smoothness. Now these bases form a space of polynomial functions, and we can have more than one basis representation. Some of these representations might be more beneficial. What we've seen so far is called the truncated power series basis, and is the simplest conceptually. The important thing to remember is that no matter the basis, once we have these expanded features, we can write f like this. Now, how do we choose the knots? First, how many knots do we use? The more knots, the more flexibility the function has, but the higher risk of overfitting. We can compare different models with different number of knots and choose the best one. Second, where do we place the knots? Two common options are equidistant, meaning equally spaced in the x domain, like this, and quantile spaced meaning placed according to the quantiles of the data distribution, say 20%, 40%, 60%, and 80%. When we choose the knots, this is often referred to as regression splines, as opposed to smoothing splines, which we will see in a bit. See you in part two.